Hello everybody, it is a bright and sunny day in Brighton UK and my producer Hobby and I are going to record my 100k Q&A. So I'm looking forward to answering all of your questions everybody. Uh, Hobby's going to read out the questions for me and I'll try and answer as many as I can. Hello Mr. Yui, let's get into it okay? You feeling good? Absolutely mate. Alright, first one's from Cartesian Otter. He says, hey Yui, how did you get involved in the school of post-Keynesian economics? Thanks again for everything you do. Uh, hello, Cartesian. I got involved in post-Keynesian economics, I think, probably first through Steve Keen and his book Debunking Economics, where he goes through a lot of the issues with mainstream economic theory in, in quite a lot of detail. But one of the things he says is that he identified most closely with the school of post-Keynesian economics. And I found some of their insights about how governments should ensure full employment, for example, quite interesting. I think one thing that also struck me about post-Keynesianism as I looked deeper into it was that they were very focused on examining the economy as it is, right? So going out, you know, how does a bank work? Well, why don't we go to a bank? Why don't we ask the bank how they work? Why don't we do some studies of banks, right? Instead of assuming it as the mainstream seem to do. Uh, and so endogenous money and the whole principle of like double entry bookkeeping uh, and how banks basically create money when they lend, that was one of the key insights that made me think, okay, these post-Keynesians, they're actually quite grounded in reality. And so from there, I just went on to read more. Mark Lavoie, I think, is an excellent um, synthesizer of post-Keynesian economics, and I'd recommend him for anyone who, who wants to know more. All right, so we got two similar questions from Sean Smith Adams and Mars Bar Michael. What advice would you give to people who aspire to be economists and also advice to people going into an undergrad from A-levels? So I'm going to use a quote, one of my favourite quotes, and I think somebody else asked about this. So here you are, a quote by John Maynard Keynes who said that the master economist is not the best at any particular field, but has to have a rare combination of gifts. So to some extent, they have to be a mathematician and a statistician. To another extent, they have to understand history uh, and politics. And therefore, my answer to those who want to be economists is kind of a difficult one. I think that you should develop a knowledge of a broad range of fields. Now, in terms of being an A-level student going into undergraduate, the primary one for you now is maths. I think if you can get really confident with calculus, with constrained optimization, uh, dynamic optimal, uh, sorry, optimal control theory, then that will really, really help you in your studies. But more broadly, you know, read about economic history, uh, develop an understanding of fields like economic sociology and political science too, because that's really going to help you to understand the economy better overall. Nice, Yui. Tia is asking, what economic or political stance did you have for a long time before being convinced that it was incorrect or invalid? This is an excellent question. I can name quite a few small ones and then perhaps a more general observation. So number one, I wasn't convinced of the success of carbon taxes. Uh, sorry, not the success. I wasn't convinced of the effectiveness of carbon taxes until recently somebody linked me a very convincing paper which showed how well they worked in Sweden at reducing emissions. So that persuaded me of the effectiveness of carbon taxes. Uh, uh, before I did all my research for my worker democracy video, I thought that we should pass a law mandating that all firms become worker co-ops of one kind or another. I now don't think that that's justified based on the existing evidence. And another one outside of economics, Ben Burgess, and to an extent, uh, Natalie Wynne of ContraPoints, convinced me that cancel culture was something which is worth exploring and in some sense real, even if maybe it's not the most useful term, there is something going on in terms of social media mobs and the harm that they can do. So those are a few opinions. I mean, one thing I'd say is that I've drifted to the right over the years. Now, this is drifting to the right from basically like as far left as you can be. So I'm still pretty left wing. But I'd say I've drifted to the right in terms of being a little bit more pragmatic, a little bit more incrementalist, experimenting with policies which promote the goals of socialism and progressivism in various ways and not not having a kind of all-in-one revolution which is something that i previously believed 
Uh, and in terms of like economics, I certainly have softened my stance on mainstream economics. I used to think, and I referenced Steve Keen's debunking economics just now, that all of mainstream economics was very theoretical and basically incoherent and useless. I still think that about some of those theories, but I do think that mainstream economics is now more empirical and there is a lot of useful stuff in there. So what I would say is overall, over time, I think I've just become more pluralist, both academically in terms of the theories that I use. I'd like to use a wide array of theories, not just post-Keynesian, not just mainstream. Uh, I might even draw from some Austrian work. But also politically, like I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all policy there. I think that we need to subscribe to uh, notions of what's called polycentricity, which is just having lots of different policies. And Eleanor Ostrom was like a big inspiration for that. And I might talk about her in a little bit. That was a great question there. Now, our man James K is asking, what policies would you promote for stronger unions while limiting their worst traits? So undoubtedly, it would be a move from firm level unions to sectoral unions. So what we've had in a lot of the Anglo American countries for a long time is unions at the level of the individual firm. And there are a few problems with this. Number one, they're not especially powerful. You have seen instances where striking workers and you know everyone can basically just be fired or be pressured into working by bringing on people from outside the firm, from outside the union. They're quite small, right? Uh, and so they have less power. Sectoral unions, you know, everyone in the restaurant industry is part of the same union, by its nature has a lot more workers, therefore a lot more power. They're also kind of competitive. So firms with unions will want to get rid of them because they can feasibly be a firm without a union. And unions may even compete with non-union workers and with other unions, perhaps. Whereas if you've got sector level unions, then you, you don't see that kind of competition. Uh, whatever worker a firm hires is very likely to be covered by a union. So that brings more people on board politically. Uh, and uh, they have more power, they're more effective. And also, what, what I quite like is the Ghent system, where unions are partly responsible for social insurance. So that means that they have a link to non-workers as well. So that, that all builds a much larger political coalition and hopefully makes them a bit less militant because it's a bit more cooperative and less competitive. One final thing I will say, and I'm not, I'm not sure this is a policy, at least from the perspective of the government, but unions definitely need to be less old style for basically male breadwinners and often white male breadwinners and they need to bring in more people uh, they do have a long history of being quite sexist of being racist and xenophobic and of being ableist as well and so i think they need to broaden their net much more uh, and that's more of an internal union policy so yeah they need to modernize in that way pad mouse begins says your favorite simpsons episode and why is it last exit to springfield okay so it's, it's uh, relevant for those who haven't seen that much Simpsons. Uh, it's relevant to the last question as well, because Last Exit to Springfield is actually about unionization and a strike. As a leftist, I feel like it should be my favorite episode, but it's not, although it's very good. I like Simpsons to, my Simpsons to be slightly later, less kind of series um, two to four and more series five to eight. So my favorite episode is actually a bit of a random one. I don't think it's most people's favorite episode, but it's uh, Bart on the Road, where Bart rents a car. Uh, and it has a lot of very iconic moments in it, including when they pick up the hitchhiker and um, the back to Winnipeg meme. So it's it's actually just got some of the best jokes in the series, I think, even though most people don't choose it. Bart, can we stop for ice cream? Yes. Bart, can we weigh the car at that weigh station? Yeah. Bart, can we pick up that hitchhiker? I don't see why not. Bart, can we stop for ice cream? Yes. Well, I didn't think I was rehabilitated, but uh, I guess they needed the extra bed. If you kids can't keep your heads to yourself, I'm gonna turn this car around and there'll be no Cape Canaveral for anybody! That's it! Back to Winnipeg! <laughs> David says, you said you're a behavioural economist. I've read Thinking Fast and Slow and found it fascinating. Are there any books in a similar vein that you could recommend suitable for a non-economist? 
So thinking fast and slow is probably one of the best. I think Kahneman, he's a psychologist and he writes probably better than most economists. There's also Nudge uh, by Thaler and Sunstein, which is a good introduction to behavioral economics. It's really readable. I don't agree with all of their policy stuff in the latter half of the book, but certainly the first half is a really good introduction. I think Gerd Gigerenza is excellent, both in his own right, but also as an antidote to a behavioral economics which just uses nudge. He tries to look at how some of the biases and heuristics may actually be rational. We can't always consider them irrational. So I would recommend his book, Rationality for Mortals. That's really good. And Generally speaking, I mean, there's a lot of papers by these people. Thaler has some really excellent, quite readable papers. Uh, so does Kahneman, Kahneman and Tversky, and Gigarenza does too. One person I will say I wouldn't recommend is uh, Dan Ariely. He wrote the book Predictably Irrational. Now, when I read that about five or 10 years ago, I can't remember, I remember giving up because I thought that it was pushing behavioral economics too far. At one point, he attributes Catholic priests abusing boys to behavioral biases or something ridiculous and i was like right okay this is where i'm out um and then it's found that he faked some of his data more recently so generally speaking avoid dan Ariely, stick to gigarenza thaler uh kahneman and tversky helium says congratulations on your 100k subscribers what reading material would you recommend for beginners wanting to learn about market socialism specifically thanks very much helium i would recommend uh perotin and also Penn Cavill, and those are two different authors on worker democracy. I think they both give the best overviews. They're really good places to get started with understanding the pros and cons of worker democracy and how it works. John Romer has written a lot on market socialism, so I would recommend some of his work. It's a little bit theoretical in part, so you might want to swerve the maths if that's not what you're into, uh, but you should check out some of some of the things he's written about market socialism. And also, I would recommend, and I'm by no means an expert on this, but I would recommend any sort of books and papers on Yugoslavia that you can get hold of. And the name of one of them escapes me, but I can put it in the references, uh, readings on Yugoslavia, because that is really the only market socialist economy that we, we've known. Justo Acontales says, since everybody is asking about economics, logically, I'll diverge a bit. Can you talk slash share a bit about your video making process? Especially the research part is hard for us in economics for us non-economists. So your insight can be helpful. This is a really good question. For those of you who are outside of economics and more broadly academia, I would recommend getting familiar with Google Scholar. Just search for the terms that you're interested in. Let's stick with the worker democracy example. Search worker democracy and search worker democracy literature reviews in particular. Try to find overviews of the subject. Read through those overviews and you might understand like 50 or 60% of it at first. I often find that that's the case. There are bits that go over my head. That's absolutely fine. Be comfortable with not fully understanding the things that you're reading. So go with these literature reviews and then look at the references therein. You'll find easily you will spot references where you're like, oh, that sounds interesting. Worker democracy results in uh, higher wages or lower wages. Uh, so you might want to investigate that. Also, you might want to learn how to use Boolean searches in Google Scholar. Now, that sounds really fancy, but all it is is just a way of searching where you can make sure that the terms that you've put in are definitely included. Uh, so you just use words like and or or in capitals. It might remind you of things you've seen before, maybe in high school physics. But that that's the best way to make sure that you're capturing all of the articles. And if you need to narrow it down, maybe try to stick to recent stuff. You can change the dates on Google Scholar as well, just like normal Google. It's not too hard to use. Uh, as, I, as I research on YouTube as well, I often search for YouTube videos. Often I'll know some already, pe things people have said on the topic and their references as well. That can be a good way to learn about things. So yeah, so that that's my research process. And to be honest, I don't really produce it. Hobby produces all my videos and he does a very good job. So I probably couldn't tell you too much about that. But when I put the script together, I'll usually start with the information, right? Like what is my argument? What's the data? 
trying to present it to people. Then I'll add, try and add some jokes, some Simpsons clips, some images and things to keep it engaging. Uh, and then I, yeah, put that all together in a script and Hobby actually puts it into practice once we've recorded it. Which is very easy because Yui's video making and script writing skills are next to none. Oh, thanks, buddy. And that's basically it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's like funny sometimes when uh, when I tell people, oh yeah, one of my jobs is I'm, I produce YouTube content for my boy who's an economist. They're like, oh, so you should be, yeah, you probably like learn loads on the job then. I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> this shit goes way over my head. But you are uh, also very focused on making it work as a video, right? Exactly. As well, so you yeah. just like, it's just pieces of a puzzle, right? Yeah, yeah, Often. it's just some words that I don't even hear. I'm just making <laughs> sure they sound good and pleasing to the ear. Um, so anyway, let's move on, buddy. Jerry Softball, I love your videos and I have learned so much from them. Congrats on reaching 100K. Do you have any advice for new grad students trying to decide on a field? I am deeply intrigued by behavioral game theory, but my department is stronger at development empirical. I'm also interested in empirical work, so I'm torn at the moment. Thank you so, so much. Thanks, Jerry, for those uh, very kind words. I think, to be honest with you, Sometimes in this world, we have to play the game a little bit. And behavioral game theory, you know, I almost went into game theory because it, it's, it's a lot of fun, right? I mean, it is literally games, right? You're analyzing games mathematically, but it's so much fun. I think that generally speaking, the economics profession is moving in a more empirical direction. I think it's going to be harder for theorists to get jobs. And I also think that if you're in a specific department, it's really good to have a whole bunch of people, especially your supervisor, who do what you do, because they can give you much better advice. Your research is going to be much better. You're going to learn a lot more. Your PhD is going to be much better. Now, I will caveat all of that by saying, don't go into something you hate just because it might be good for your career. You don't want to hate it. But if empirical development economics is your second favorite topic or your third favorite topic, then it might be worth actually doing that. And keeping the behavioral game theory as something of a hobby, which maybe you pursue uh, alongside your PhD or after you've finished your PhD, but you don't want to be kind of stranded in an apartment where nobody really understands what you're doing and you're not getting that much support. Kalen Ergang. If it's not too late to ask, what do you think of channels like Economics Explained who make short digestible economics content, usually from a pretty mainstream perspective? Uh, it's not too late to ask, uh, Kalen. Now, I went through some of these questions. I just compiled as many as I could, and I put down little notes uh, to remind myself of important things to say in my answer. All I've put in this comment is, uh. So economics explained, look, I've said many times that I don't like being a snob. You've got to make things digestible. You've got to simplify things sometimes if you're communicating to a big audience and Economics Explained does have a very big audience. But over time, over the past couple of years, arguably since the pandemic, maybe before then, they've gone down this very crude kind of online libertarian rabbit hole. And they're talking about things like hyperinflation, uh, Money and Macro did a fantastic response video to their video on hyperinflation, which was just completely wrong. We're not having hyperinflation. Yes, we have slightly higher inflation, but it's not for the reasons that they would believe anyway. And I just think they've gone down the path that's going to get them the most views, unfortunately, which which is a shame because elements of their videos, you know, they might explain the economy of Norway and yeah, okay, it's just kind of Wikipedia with stock footage, but that's fine. I don't mind that kind of thing, to be honest. At least you might learn a thing or two. But when they start just going straight for views and saying things which are outright wrong, then I'm out. Uh, I, I don't watch that channel anymore, unfortunately. No Justice says, what's your opinion on the pedestrianisation of Norwich City Centre? Well, I for one am dead against it because people forget that traders need access to Dixons. Elliot says, which country or government in history would you say has most closely aligned with your political economic ideology? It has to be the Nordic countries, to be honest. Although I wouldn't call them socialist, they lack worker democracy substantively. They do have some board representation which is a step in the right direction, but they, they don't really have worker democracy. But their welfare states are so effective and generous and their cities are so well planned and they experiment with and pursue policies which are 
completely in line with what we need to be doing, which is number one, eliminating poverty, and number two, stopping environmental catastrophe. Uh, so, for example, Oslo banned cars in the city center. Uh, there's been trials of uh, four-day work weeks um, in in those countries. I think it was Sweden, but I can't remember which one. Uh, Finland experimented with just giving homes to homeless people. Yeah, it's not full socialism. They are still capitalist, but ultimately, all of these things are so good that I just think that they're they're most in line with what I would like to see. Norm Trooper asks, is the International Monetary Fund unambiguously bad for the global south or is there some nuance to its use as an instrument of neoliberalism? So the IMF certainly had a terrible record from a humanistic point of view and even an economic point of view, to be honest, uh, during the 80s, especially with its structural adjustment policies, which imposed free market or neoliberal policies on poor countries. So in that sense, it was an instrument of neoliberalism. I think it's changed somewhat. I'm less familiar with what it does now, to be honest with you. I think there's comparatively less analysis of what it does now. I do think that it's mellowed out a little bit and it allows things like you know investment in health and education, for example. So there is some nuance to it, but I want to make a broader point, which is that I think the issue is really US dollar dominance. A lot of poor countries and every country in the world really but this bites harder for poor countries they rely on the dollar they need to make transactions in the dollar us banks are dominant and obviously they can't make dollars themselves so they are ultimately dependent on the central banks of the us and it's well known that the actions of the us um, central bank the federal reserve they can have massive knock-on effects on on developing countries yet developing countries have absolutely no say in this but they're stuck with the dollar if they want to participate at all in the global economy so what i think we need is something that john maynard Keynes suggested which is a reserve currency which is not attached to any one central bank which is controlled more democratically and then what you'll get is hopefully a situation where countries are less likely to need to go to the IMF or its equivalent in the first place because they'll be able to access the global reserve currency more easily and under more democratic, uh, looser conditions. Galen Lunari is asking, what are some econ papers slash books every socialist should read in your opinion? I really like the book Eleanor Ostrom's Rules for Radicals. It's not by Eleanor Ostrom. It's uh, a more modern book. I forget the author now, but it's quite a short book, which just goes through the work of Ostrom and how it can advance communitarian ideas and solutions. Ostrom's own paper, Beyond Markets and States, is also really good on this. So I would recommend that for moving away from ideas that center state allocation and also those that center market allocation and showing us alternatives of how communities can organize. Anything by Yanis Varoufakis, I think is very good. That's a bit of a bigger picture. His um, conversations with my daughter is really excellent, excellent as an introduction to economics. And here's another now is a good example of what a socialist world might look like. Ha Jun Chang's Economics a User's Guide, I always recommend this book. He's not exactly a socialist, but it is just really good as a generalized introduction to economics. Uh, another thing I'd recommend, which is a bit more of a mainstream paper, is the Card Kruger paper on the minimum wage in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. It's the original minimum wage paper, which showed that it doesn't have negative effects on employment. It's such a good paper. It's such a good example of how this type of evidence can change minds and show that the most hardcore version of mainstream neoclassical economics is just wrong. I think that's really worth reading. Red says, yo, are there any political philosophers that you like? If so, who? So I'm, I'm not too familiar. I haven't read the classics myself. I do like Matt Brunig a lot. I'm not sure if you call him a political philosopher, but going through Brunig's old blog posts, his ability to cut through a whole load of nonsense that people have been talking about for centuries and just come to a very clear, very persuasive conclusions is unparalleled. 
he's really good. On a similar note, David Runkyman, who does Talking Politics, The History of Ideas podcast, he will introduce you to a whole load of political philosophy across the years. So across the ages, I should say, not just across the years. So that's uh, really good as an introduction. One actual political philosopher I like is Adam Swift. So his take on Isaiah Berlin's distinction between positive and negative liberty and how it doesn't really make sense is really good. So the idea is that positive liberty is your ability to actually do things, to marshal resources, to go and do something that you want to do, like say start a business. Uh, whereas negative liberty is when somebody's like actually constraining you physically and saying, no, you can't start a business. But one thing that Swift points out is that, well, money often constrains our ability to do things. So if you want to go and start a business and say, let's say, for simplicity, get a factory and a load of raw materials and make some cars, if you go into a factory and start like acting like you own it, uh, then eventually what will happen is you'll be dragged out by police. So that's negative liberty, but Berlin would call that positive liberty, right? You're actually being constrained by the law to do what you want to do. And so the distinction that Berlin makes, I think, kind of relies on this um, false dichotomy and ignoring the negative liberty that is inherent to property rights and, and to a market society which where you can get permission to do things with money. You're a great speaker, bro. <laughs> you really bro. are. Now, Eva is asking, do you think the Chinese economic model can be adapted elsewhere or is it too context dependent? And in that note... What should developing countries aim at in terms of a development model? I would say that the Chinese economic model was very specific to China, such a large country with a very authoritarian state that has quite a lot of control given the size of the country is extremely rare. The unique position that China found itself in after the death of Mao was also rare. I think Mao's policies were largely abhorrent, but one thing they did, this is one of the perversities of history, one thing they did was completely upend the existing feudal system and they did improve some outcomes in terms of health and education and this arguably laid the ground for a capitalist revolution uh, that Deng Xiaoping implemented. So I think there were very unique historical circumstances. Not only is it very difficult to repeat them, but they, I don't think they should be repeated because obviously what led up to that point was not something that we want to do. So I really don't think that, that China can be emulated or should be emulated. One thing I will say, though, is that they had quite a lot of pragmatism. Now, I'm, I'm no expert on China. So Yi Wen, I think I found really persuasive on China. I'd recommend looking up talks and uh, his book and articles by him. But he said that basically they were quite pragmatic, right? So I think this is a lesson that you've got to be pragmatic. They worked with existing technologies. There were really old technologies in, in uh, the agricultural sector. Uh, the peasant farmers had, they were self-sufficient. And what China said was, okay, well, you can sell, you know, some of what you produce on the market, uh, but not necessarily all of it. So they worked with, you know, the existing um, kind of self-sufficient, self-employed system. And they implemented a whole range of different policies, experimented. And that is a good lesson for, I think, poor countries. And one of my favorite papers, which relates back to an earlier question, is uh, the one on the Atlas of Economic Complexity. And that speaks a lot about how countries with, particular economies that produce particular things should only pursue industries that are close to what they already produce, right? So if you have like uh, an oil industry, for example, um, you might go, you might want to go into cars, but you don't necessarily want to go from oil to, you know, silicon chips and high tech computers or something like that. So environmental considerations, notwithstanding, it's just an example, but this idea of um, pragmatism, I think, is something we can take from China. But, you know, generally speaking, it, it is a one-off, very unique. Yuri Strauss asks, do you believe that capitalists exploit workers? If so, what is the mechanism of exploitation? I do believe that capitalists exploit workers in general. I don't necessarily believe in the Marxist interpretation of this, which rests on the labour theory of value. And that will be probably my next next video on theories of value. But 
Why do they? I think it's, it's a simple matter of choice. When you're exploited, you don't have a choice and somebody is making you do something that you don't necessarily want to do because you have no alternative. And under capitalism, at least under raw capitalism, workers don't have a choice other than to work. There are typically a lot more workers than there are employers. Uh, employers or businesses have access to capital and the means of production, whereas workers don't. So this creates an asymmetry and workers have to have to work and they often don't have that much choice about where they work either. Now, this can change depending on conditions, depending on the welfare state, depending on the state of employment. Are we near full employment? Depending on labor regulations and unions and all of these things. And depending on also, I think, how wealthy you are, whether you have an education and things. So I would say that highly educated workers are much less exploited than uh, less educated, poorer workers, because they usually have more choices. But ultimately, yes, I think that um, capitalists do exploit workers. Patrick is asking for your take on qualitative research methods in economics. I'm in favour of greatly expanding qualitative research. I think there was a phrase used by a qualitative researcher. It might actually have been Claudia Sarm. I can't remember, but they, they said when they actually went to a factory and observed things. They said, oh, you can learn a lot by just watching. And it's true because often as economists and academics, we don't really understand how businesses really work. And just visiting them and talking to people can give you a really good idea of how these things work. So there's a few good papers on qualitative research. I think George Akerlof had one in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, if I'm not wrong, about qualitative research recently where he was promoting it and things like for example so people who'd actually gone out to rural areas of america pre-2016 and spoken with the people there were the people who were able to warn about something like donald trump getting elected because they actually had an understanding of what was going on that was you know rich richer than just simple statistics on wages might tell you. They understood that these areas had been decimated. There was very little opportunity and they understood, you know, obviously the history of racism and what people there believed. So that type of thing, it can just tell us things that I don't think statistics necessarily can. So I'm massively in favor of expanding that. All right, Daffer is asking, what do you think about the argument which says that market mechanism could still breed inequality? Therefore, it's necessary to replace market with central planning as the first step to achieve socialism. Well, Daffer, I like the first part of that uh, argument. I'm not so sure about the second part. So market mechanisms, I think, do tend to breed inequality. If you take market socialism in Yugoslavia, which is obviously a situation where firms are internally democratic, they have worker democracy, there was still massive inequality across uh, between firms between regions as well, because specific industries are often concentrated in specific regions for historical reasons and for reasons of access to real raw resources. And so what you had was some were just much richer than others. And this was a consequence of markets of those regions maybe fetching a higher price on the market, right? And therefore their business ultimately making more money. And therefore you need redistribution. <laughs> so I don't I don't understand why you'd necessarily need central planning because redistribution basically solves that problem, right? If you have a really robust welfare state, if you have robust progressive taxation to support it, then you can massively reduce inequality. Uh, central planning comes with so many problems around surrounding coordination, surrounding the creation of another elite, uh, the people who do the planning, the people who are in control. So I don't think central planning is necessarily the solution. Uh, one, one other thing I will say, and I mentioned Eleanor Ostrom earlier, is that communitarian solutions and the work of Murray Bookchin is really good on this as well. How we bring technologies into communities and govern them pragmatically according to the needs of the community, that type of thing is something that I'd like to see more of. And that can be more equitable because things are all contained and controlled within the community and there may not even be a need for market mechanisms. So that's a long-term thing I'd like to see. I'd like to be pragmatic about it. But central planning, I think, despite, as I said at the very beginning of this video, 
some of the furore over central planning being a bit exaggerated, I do think that it failed. And I don't think that it can provide consumption needs for a domestic economy. Jay is asking, is economics a worthwhile degree to pursue, as there is limited employment for economics majors outside of academia, political advisory roles, think tanks, authors, etc.? So I think it is a worthwhile degree to pursue. I do love the field of economics on a, on a non-instrumental note, not thinking about employment. I do love the field of economics. I think it's hugely important. There is limited employment for, for economics majors outside of, and then you listed like four things. So I feel like you're <laughs> outside of all the areas where economics majors might be employed. I suppose there is limited employment, but uh, you know, I'm not trying to be facetious, mate. Look, they're, they're outside of those four even there are there are lots of places that economists can be employed they can be employed uh in the private sector um and they can be employed in unions as well uh, and they can be employed in the civil service right so i'm not sure if that will come under political advisory roles but i do think that em economists can be employed in a wide variety of roles and even if you're not employed as an economist economics is quite highly regarded so if you're thinking about employment, honestly, I, I think an economics degree is probably one of the better degrees you could you could get. Zohar, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, says, well, oh, she's asking your opinion on donut economics as a way for changing paradigm in economics. Also, the Beyond GDP, Wellbeing Economic Alliance, the UNDP, PHDI, etc. Uh, that's a lot of things, Zohar. So I'll just focus on the donut economics, if you don't mind. I do think that donut economics, uh, by Kate Rayworth, by the way, for... Uh, anyone who's not familiar with it, it's this idea that we can represent a sustainable, just, efficient economy through a donut, uh, where on the inside of the donut, we uh, don't provide enough, you know, we're producing too little. And then on the outside of the donut, we're overshooting and we're endangering the environment by producing too much uh, fast fashion, um, you know, advertising, and uh, planned obsolescence and things like that. Uh, too much consumerism, too much production, essentially. So we want to stay in the middle, which is the donut, which is kind of like the safe space for humanity. And I've been extremely impressed because although, and I, I, I hope Kate wouldn't mind me saying this, but I think those these ideas have been around for quite a while. She's done such a good job of presenting them, making them easy to understand. And I know that Amsterdam actually got her on board to guide their policy and they're using the donut model as a guide to policy. So I've not seen anything from ecological economics or from any other area of economics that has been as effective at communicating how we need to stay within environmental limits while also providing for human needs. So I think that's a really excellent framework, to be honest. Shit's making me want a donut. <laughs> Cameron Archibald, who's this brother? You know him. Got a verified tick. No, no, I don't. I don't. Cameron is asking, if Scotland became an independent country, what currency should it use? Should it be a new currency, the euro, a monetary union with the UK, or sterlingization, sterling without monetary union? I'd say that if Scotland were to become an independent country, ignoring the question of whether it should, this is something that I actually don't have too much of an opinion on, to be honest. But if it did, I think they would probably should probably stick uh, to a monetary union with the UK. Now, today, you know, in a world that is being beset by things like pandemics and war and the looming threat of or the ongoing threat of climate change, I really don't think it's a time for a relatively small country like Scotland to create its own currency. It might benefit from a bit of currency devaluation. Uh, but to be honest, with an economy that historically has been so dependent on oil, I think it's better for it to stay tied to the UK. Now, you said one thing about sterlingization, sterling without a monetary union. Now, I don't really know too much about this, but I'm not 100% sure how that would work because it seems to me that you are one way or another, if you have pound sterling, you are one way or another connected to what the UK does. And I think some Latin American countries struggle by being dollarized, right? So they're, they're connected to the dollar but they don't have any power at all in how it operates. And so I wouldn't want to emulate that. I think that's caused places like Argentina, for example, a lot, a lot of serious economic problems. So I think it's best just to say we're in a monetary union with the UK. 
you know, we have the pound, uh, even if we're politically independent and have some seat at the table that way. Lovely stuff, mate. And that is all our questions for today. Yeah, we've we've run out of questions. Uh, thank you very much. There's some really good questions in there. And uh, I hope you all have a fantastic day, week, month, year. And I guess we'll see you at a million. See you at a mil. Um, see you at a mil. Probably half a mil, really. <laughs> Maybe yeah. even a quarter of a mil. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's your next video on you? It is going to be a video about uh, Jordan Peterson focused not on him as an individual because there's enough of that but on his take on the gender pay gap and general statistics surrounding pay and labor and gender because i think he's very deeply wrong about these things and i'm not sure anybody's actually done that comprehensive a takedown of it on youtube uh, also i want loads of views so that's one way to get them <laughs> <laughs> all right like and subscribe like and subscribe and uh, hit us up on Patreon as well. Man's trying to get paid still. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've just been watching. Just been watching Top Boy. So uh, please do excuse me. <laughs> Anything else, buddy? Thanks so much to everybody. Like, I'm so happy that I've reached a hundred thousand. Uh, and you know, I'm so glad that you all, you know, keep watching my videos and keep enjoying them. And every little message you send of support is appreciated obviously i don't see a hundred percent of them but every time i see one it brings a smile to my face so don't hesitate to keep sending those love that see you later guys